I'm going to talk of uh, some algorithm, uh, which I called adaptive fever sort algorithm, and which is a variant of some other sorting algorithm, which is uh, widely used, which is team sort algorithm. Okay. And so, I mean, basically uh, today, I mean, uh, the talk I will make is uh, uh, about, uh, I mean, saying why team sort was some interesting algorithm and what its features were. Okay. And then, uh, basically, I copied them, but adapting uh, them uh, slightly so that I, I would have some improvement uh, on the complexity of the algorithm, which gave uh, adaptive fever sort. And so, in particular, in the end of the talk, I plan to give some proof of complexity of uh, adaptive fever sort. But uh, if we don't do that, I mean, like, it's okay because it's not uh, uh, the central part of what I want to give you as, uh, as ideas to remember from this talk. Okay. And so I'm very happy to be uh, uh, a guest here, although it's just uh, online and not uh, physically in Sophie Germa. Okay. So uh, my talk will be as follows. First, I will uh, say a few things about uh, efficient mirror sorts in general. And then I will present more in detail team sort, okay, while actually never giving the full details of the algorithm itself. And finally, in my third part, as you can see, I will switch from team sort to adaptive shiver sort so they are really like each other and i will uh, spend more time explaining how adaptive shiver sort works but it will be always in parallel with team sort itself okay. and so uh well one problem that is uh, that is important so when i was in phd i did like computer science about uh, some mathematical objects and i found them important but most uh, the most important part for, for me was that uh, they were fun objects to work with and here, uh, in that work, I'm working on sorting problems. So at least, I mean, like, the reason why this is important is uh, obvious. And so it's just you have some bunch of data. You can compare every two data in your array. And you would like to sort that array okay, in increasing order. And so uh, in practice, uh, well, I was told when I was younger, like uh, 15 years ago, that uh, some good algorithm is merge sort because its worst time uh, case time complexity is uh, of the order of magnitude of n log n when I want to sort some array of size n, okay? And so natural question is, can we do better? And, uh, well, uh, in general, we cannot, uh, because basically if uh, our algorithm is using, uh, I mean, comparison between pairs of elements, each comparison, it will give you one bit information. And then, uh, if you started from some permutation of the elements from 0 to n minus 1, uh, being able to sort it and looking at uh, those element uh, moves that you have done, you would be able to recover the original permutation you, you went from. And so, I mean, these comparisons, they, they should allow you to distinguish between the factorial and possible reorderings. And thus, the number of uh, tests that you need is at least log of factorial n base 2 which is n log n, and you cannot do better if you just do a comparison between pairs of elements. So I see that uh, Yasin was work, uh, okay, writing something, but not, okay. And so it's what I learned when I was, uh, I mean, a junior university student. And so for me, the, the story of uh, sorting algorithms uh, was done there. So like, it's, uh, it's nice because we have something optimal, and it's a bit sad because then, since it's optimal, we cannot go further, okay. So it's, it would have been the end of the talk, uh, as I was told uh, 15 years ago. Okay. So yes, if uh, somebody is not seeing the slides, then just say it because, like, uh, otherwise it will be hard to follow. Okay. Uh, and so, okay, so I mean, when I was younger, I believed that this would be the end of this talk, which would be very short in practice. But it's not because, okay, so here. I mean, I, I say that we cannot do, in general, do better than n log n comparisons. But in some cases, if you are very lucky with uh, the array you want to sort, then you should be able to do much better. For instance, here, my array is already sorted. And so, I mean, basically, uh, it should take uh, n comparisons to just see that it's sorted. OK, you compare 0 to 1, and then 1 to 2, and 2 to 3, etc. And so you instantly guess the order because it's a natural order. And, and then you don't have anything more to do. So if you're very lucky, the time that you would need to sort your favorite array uh, should be of the order of magnitude of n and not n log n. Okay. So in general, you cannot do better, but maybe in some relevant instances, you can. 
And so that's uh, this kind of instances that we want to look at. Okay. And so in particular, uh, well, I mean, just in the slide later, uh, we will capture some notions that say that this already sorted array should be more simple than a random array. And therefore, it's normal that uh, you would require a, a fewer amount of uh, information to store that array and uh, fewer comparisons to sort it. Okay. So in particular, what we can do is that uh, our array of data, we will divide it between uh, non-decreasing subarrays. Okay. And I choose them to be maximal for the inclusion, for instance. And we could also adapt this. For instance, if I have either non-decreasing or strictly decreasing uh, subarrays, okay, I could divide my uh, array uh, between those subarrays with uh, either non-decreasing or decreasing uh, uh, properties. But in general, I mean, for the sake of uh, simplicity, in you know, all this presentation, I just focus of on what would happen if I have non-decreasing subarrays, and I will call them runs in what follows. So here, I mean, first I do have uh, some uh, white run that goes from 0 to 4, and then another one that goes from 0 to 5. Then I have a single element run that only has the element 4 in it, and then two runs of length 2 at the end. Okay. So this array is slightly sorted, but not too much. Okay. While the previous array it only had one run, so it was very much sorted. Okay. And, and then, so... Well, now we do have more parameters than before. So before, the only parameter we had, it was n, the length of the array. And therefore, I mean, we could not do much better than just finding some kind of uniform bound over all those arrays of length n. Okay. But now here we see that we do have five runs whose lengths are 4, 3, 1, 2, and 2. Okay. And so these are additional parameters that uh, we might consider taking into account when looking at how many comparisons we need. Okay. Because, for instance, uh, when we have only one run, then its length will be n, and basically there are few comparisons only to do. Okay. And so these are the new parameters, the additional parameters we have, and together we can combine them into what I, I call the run length entropy. So you have the formula on the right, it's the sum of uh, the length of uh, uh, the run number i divided by the length of uh, the array, and then you take a log of uh, the inverse of that ratio, okay, and you do the sum. So the meaning of that is just if you try to take some element of uh, the array uniformly at random, then it must belong to some of the runs of your array. okay. And so you have some random variable that tells you which run your element belongs to. okay. And this uh, curve h that I have written is actually the entropy of that random variable. Okay. And so it um, somehow captures the notion that when your entropy is larger, then you do have more disorder in your array. So in particular, if I just did have like uh, only two uh, two runs okay, uh, in, my, in my array, so I will just make a drawing here. So here, let's imagine I, I do have a super long run and then a very short run. So these lines are proportional to the size of the run, let's say. Okay. Then, uh, basically, in particular, if uh, my length here is just 1, and here it's n minus 1, okay? okay. So I'm trying to write it uh, hard. Oops. Uh, okay. So n minus 1 on the left and 1 on the right. Then the real number of comparisons I would need is logarithmic in n, just because I would need to insert my rightmost element to its right place. Something like this. And plus maybe end first comparisons to actually see that I do have a large run on the left. But on the contrary, if I do have, I mean, like uh, two uh, runs of size uh, n over 2 both, uh, then certainly you do have some more work to do to merge those two runs to get something uh, like a merge sort. Okay. And so this run length entropy does capture uh, this kind of uh, fact that if you have one super large run and one very small run, you have more order than if you just have two runs of size uh, n over 2. Okay. And so in general, if I want to get rid of some of the parameters like the run length or even the number of runs, I can still find upper bounds on uh, this h, which is the at most log of uh, the number of runs and therefore at most log of uh, the number of elements in the array. Okay. Uh, and then, so actually there is a, a theorem 
uh, that has been proved uh, many times, okay, uh, that would say that you do have some merge sort algorithm whose worst case time complexity is of the order of magnitude of uh, n plus n times the entropy. And, and so it's a bit analog to what we had before, but before we had uh, n log n, and now we have re replaced uh, log n by something smaller, which is the entropy, which is not much smaller in general, but maybe smaller like if my array is already sorted. And in particular, uh, it turns out that team sort, which is uh, the algorithm I will present later, okay, uh -huh. does have such a complexity. Yes, there is a question? Yeah, I have a question, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, who is it? Who it is? It's uh, it's Yasin. Okay. So okay, I tr so if you take two uh, two slices of size n over two. Yep. If you plug it into the computation of h, you obtain something small, no? Small. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, h is small. If I do have two runs, then uh, my entropy it should be something like uh, one. Yeah, so it means it's easier to sort two runs of size n over two than one of size n minus one. I don't know, because if I do have one run of length n minus one and one run of length one, yeah. then my entropy is actually very small. It's yeah. of the order of magnitude of uh, log n over n or something like this. Oh, yeah, it's log n over n. It's, okay, it's yeah. not log n, it's log n over Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. I forgot the, the n, okay. So anyway, the, the entropy cannot be too high because, uh, I mean, like the upper bound, it's log of the number of runs, okay? And in particular, I mean, it's maximal when all the runs have the same length, and then the entropy is equal to the number, to log of the number of runs. So it was uh, one in our case because you had two runs in your example. Okay, so then you get n plus n times one. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, so it turns out that team sort does have this kind of complexity. And so it means that if your array is already uh, uh, quite uh, well sorted, then it will go faster, which is good, okay? Which explains why this algorithm was uh, chosen in practice. Uh, I mean, in Java or Python, for instance. And, and then, so actually with the same kind of arguments as before, so uh, saying that if you count, uh, I mean, the number of comparisons you do, each comparison gives you one bit information, etc. Then we can prove that actually it's infeasible in general to do better than uh, n plus nh up to a multiplicative constant. Okay, because basically you need to read uh, the whole input, and then you need to distinguish uh, possible reorderings, and the number of possible reorderings you have is at least uh, n times h divided by two, and the time you need to read the input is uh, of the order of magnitude of n. So uh, I mean you cannot do much better than that. Uh, and so that's why, I mean, this is a good uh, complexity, although you do have some uh, big O in it. Okay. Um, and so in particular, I mean, what follows, we will try to get rid of the big O and really evaluate uh, the constant we have here. Okay. And then, uh, I mean, improve the algorithm so that uh, the constant will be lower. So that's the purpose of what we do. Okay. So now I'm going to present team source. And uh, I will begin with some brief history of team sort. Okay. So actually, I didn't know this uh, this algorithm before I arrived in uh, in Marne Lavalle. It's just uh, there were colleagues of mine, uh, so Cyril Nico and Karin Pivoto, uh, who worked on that algorithm, and they wanted to find uh, uh, the upper bound I presented just before. So uh, that's one of this theorem. Okay. Um, and then, so uh, we learned uh, some stuff about this algorithm, and in the end, we could prove this uh, bound. And later, when uh, tweaking the proofs, we could improve it. Okay. So first, the history begins in 2002. Okay. So uh, the algorithm team sort, it was invented by Tim Peters, and then some of his colleagues uh, decided to name the algorithm team sort in, uh, I mean, just uh, to praise Tim Peters himself. Okay. Uh, and then. Uh, it was very, very effective in practice. So there was still no kind of, uh, I mean, robust uh, analysis of, uh, of the, the complexity of the algorithm, but still it was very efficient in practice. And so one year later, it was a, a standard algorithm in Python for sorting. So it's really, really, really good. And then, I mean, later, so I mean, in Android and Java and Okta, so lots of other languages, okay. It became a standard algorithm for non-primitive arrays only. So non-primitive arrays is just arrays where your data is not uh, 
I mean, it's not like an integer, but it's composite data, let's say. Okay. So it's objects in Java, for instance, and not primitive types. And, and then, um, surprisingly, it was only like 14 years after the algorithm was invented that uh, there was some uh, complexity analysis where it was proven that uh, team sort would work in time uh, and log in in the worst case. So it's like uh, for 13 years, we have used an algorithm which was very efficient in practice. And uh, we had not even cared of whether it would work in time n square or n log n. Uh, but so in the end, it was proven that it was a good algorithm because it worked in n log n. And so the next step was to make it, uh, I mean, be better because it would have like some kind of nh uh, upper bound of complexity. Uh, and so that's what happened uh, three years la later. So in 2018, with uh, Cyril uh, and Karine, we proved that actually team sort would work in time uh, n plus uh, nh, which uh, matches uh, the, the lower bound and is the theorem I mentioned uh, two slides before. Okay. And at the same time, it turns out that uh, in 2015, so other people in the Netherlands, and then in 2018 again, so while we were working on the complexity of TeamSort, we uncovered uh, bugs in the implementations of TeamSort in Python and Java. And these bugs, they were linked to the fact that uh, uh, the space complexity of the algorithm uh, had been uh, underestimated in the heuristics that had led to, I mean, uh, the conception of the algorithm itself. Okay. Uh, and so, I mean, at some point in the algorithm, you need some data structure which were implemented by a fixed size arrays, let's say, okay, or fixed size uh, data structure, and the fixed size in question was uh, was not enough. Okay, so also, I mean, this would demonstrate the fact that, uh, I mean, the time complexity is important, obviously, and it was not done for like thirteen years, and then the space complexity, in particular, if you use it for your implementation, is crucially important. Because if my algorithm takes twice more time than I had forecast, OK, maybe I can deal with it. But if it takes twice more space than I have allocated to it to run, then I do have huge problems. Okay. And so now, in practice, what happened is that, uh, well, there were proven, proven fixes for this algorithm implementation. And so now, there is no problem in either Python or Java. Okay. So this is a, a bit of the history of the algorithm itself. And now we will present the, the principles of the algorithm. So it's based on merging adjacent runs in some array. So here I do have a one run that is a 0, 2, 2, 4. And the next run is a 0, 1, 5. And so they will be merged together. Uh, so it will give me a 0, 0, 1, 2, 2, 4, 5. Okay. So I just have one run now. And I did have two runs before. So in fact, um, having adjacent runs that I merge is something important. So it does have nice properties. The first one is that then we will get some stable algorithm, which means that uh, if I do have, like here, I did have uh, my, um, I did have this zero, OK? And then I do have that zero, OK? And, and uh, the leftmost zero, it stays to the left of the rightmost zero. So in practice, I mean, you have lots of algorithms that are used to sort objects that do that can be compared using different keys, let's say, or different uh, ways of comparison. And for instance, maybe I have sorted all the students in the university by the year they enrolled in the university, and then I want to sort them again uh, because of uh, the first letter of uh, their first name, okay, in alphabetical order, let's say. And but basically, I don't want to destroy my first sorting. It's just the second sorting, uh, or the first sorting is used to to deal with ties. And so if you have a stable algorithm, then you can deal with ties like that. Okay. Also, uh, why it's important that uh, we do actually only merge adjacent runs is because, so here, imagine I do have like three runs in my array. Okay. What means the arrow? Uh, ah, uh, no, no, it's not an arrow from 4 to 2. It's just the arrow from the above array to the below array. Okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, thanks for the question. Otherwise, you cannot understand. And so ah, I was saying, imagine that I do have uh, three runs, OK? And and then so I will uh, call them up. OK, I, I cannot write here. I don't know why. OK, anyways. Uh, so I said 
okay, so I have uh, one run A and then uh, one run uh, B and then uh, one run C, okay? And now if I wanted to merge the runs A and C, well, I mean, it won't work because I'm working on some array and not some linked list. And then basically I will have to exchange uh, the run C with the run B or something like this. But it's very difficult or uh, infeasible in practice to merge uh, non-adjacent runs. So that's why here, I mean, like we are focused only on merging adjacent trends. So it's important and uh, it gives us a nice property for free. Okay. Uh, and then, so it turns out that uh, the run merging algorithm uh, that is used in team sort is kind of standard, but plus it has many optimizations and we will not look at these optimizations. Okay. So they exist and they may be important depending on which your point of view is, but from our point of view, they will not be important. So in particular, what we should just remember is that when you merge two runs of sizes K and L, then in the worst case, so like uh, given these lengths, but uh, if you are unlucky with uh, the content of uh, both your subarrays, okay, then it should take time uh, uh, proportional to K plus L and the memory proportional to the minimum of K and L. Okay, That is uh, the run merging procedure that is used in TeamSort. And so here, since we don't want to look at the content of the runs, okay, which might be relevant, but we don't do it, then we'll just assume that, okay, so merging two adjacent runs of sizes K and L, it will cost us K plus L. Okay. And so now, uh, the complexity we will be evaluating is just that merge cost. So we don't focus anymore on the time complexity or the memory complexity. We'll assume that, okay, I mean, they are approximately equal to the merge cost, and we only evaluate the merge cost. And so this is a standard for studying other algorithms as well. Okay. And then it turns out that uh, the policy that is used by team sort uh, and adaptive fever sort then for choosing which runs should be merged depends on the run length only. So in practice, this means that uh, for our complexity, why is the memory mean KL? Okay, so uh, I answer Frederick's question and then I come back to what I was saying. So the memory is uh, mean KL. Uh, basically, because uh, like the way it's done, so here L is shorter than K, okay. And uh, for instance, uh, what happens is that uh, we use an extra uh, buffer array of size L in which we uh, basically copy the shortest run, and then now we can uh, so we have uh, that copy of uh, the shortest run, and then we can deal with K and the vacant place that is L, so that we can fill everything. But ah, there could be some other implementations, okay? So like, I mean, you can do merge in place, okay? But then it, uh, it destroys your multiplicative constant. Or you can do something more clever, but it's not what is done in, uh, in team sort. In team sort, it's really, you just uh, start copying, uh, okay, up to some optimizations that are mild, uh, the, the shortest trend. Okay. So, yeah, sure. And in practice, I mean, like, it turns out that it was not so such a problem because, I mean, like, uh, I mean, this kind of space was not an issue according to those people who ran tests uh, at Oracle, for instance. Okay. So now, if I come back to the complexity analysis itself, I mean, what we want to do is just evaluate the total merge cost of the algorithm. So, like, the merge cost, and then you take the sum over all the merges that we will perform. And then, since uh, the values in the array itself, they will have no influence on which runs are merged and on the cost of that merge, then we will forget those values and we will work only with the length of the runs uh, that uh, the array is consisting, uh, consisting of, okay? So that's what we do later. So now, I mean, uh, I just want to recall some I mean, results about the merge cost of uh, some stable merge sort, okay? And so basically we can prove that whenever you take some uh, algorithm, uh, merge algorithm, okay? Uh, even in the best case, uh, the merge cost will be at least uh, n times the entropy. Okay, like if it's just based on merging uh, uh, adjacent runs. Okay, and whatever the policy you have for choosing which runs you want to merge first, etc., you cannot do better than n h. Okay, so this is a universal uh, lower bound in the best case. And then in the worst case, we can prove that every algorithm it has a worst case merge cost that is at least uh, n h plus two n. Okay. And so there is a simple case where uh, this arrives. 
It's when you have a gigantic uh, large run, and then you have a very small run at the left and a very small run at the uh, right. Okay, because here I'm mean, using that you will just need to to merge the central run with one of the extremal runs and then with the other one. So the total case it should be two n. Okay, maybe two n minus one, but let's say it's the other order of magnitude of two n. And at the same time, your uh, entropy is ridiculously low. So n h is uh, much, much smaller than n itself. And so here, I mean, uh, we see that uh, the nh plus 2n in that example, the nh counts for nothing, and it's only the 2n that you have. So you cannot do better than two, uh, nh. And then you have some cases where you cannot do better than 2n plus nh. So that's why we do have this kind of worst cases. Okay. Uh, and then, so it turns out that uh, the worst case uh, of uh, merge cost of steam sort is a three halves times nh plus uh, a linear factor in n, okay? So which I, I discard because uh, on a usual uh, on usual arrays, I mean, h will be uh, large, let's say. So here, these are the bounds for team sort. It's between nh and uh, three halves of nh plus uh, some uh, error term. Okay. And, and then, so there is another algorithm that was proposed uh, in 2018, which is called power sort. And actually, its worst case uh, merge cost is exactly uh, nh plus 2n. And so basically, you cannot do better than that. Okay. Uh, but uh, the merge policy of power sort is slightly complicated. So it's not too much complicated. I mean, it's uh, rather feasible to, to code. But uh, let's say, I mean, if you want to switch from team sort to power sort, uh, maybe this, I mean, you could have some surprises and it's not so easy to, to rewrite. Uh, meaning that, uh, I mean, then I do have adaptive shiver sort, and going from power, uh, some, from team sort to adaptive shiver sort, you just need to change four lines in your code, okay? And uh, then it does not change much uh, to the dynamics of the algorithm itself, okay? While power sort, uh, you need to rewrite some data structures, etc. So it's, uh, I mean, the cost of uh, switching from one algorithm to another one is uh, higher if you want to go from team sort to power sort than from team sort to adaptive shiver sort itself. Okay. And it turns out that adaptive shiver sort, so which is the algorithm I, I will mention and discuss a, in the remaining minutes, okay? Uh, so it's really, really like team sort. And its worst case is close to NH plus 2N because it's just that it's NH plus uh, delta N where delta is uh, approximately 2.5, okay? And so this delta here, like uh, this constant, it's optimal, okay? For, for that algorithm, I mean. So now, what I will do next is uh, present you a proof that uh, basically you cannot do better than, and I mean, the complexity for adaptive shiver sort in terms of match cost, it will be bounded above by nh plus a constant time n. Okay. So like uh, we will not go to the delta, and the proof I will invoke actually uh, I don't I cannot use it to go to that margin delta. Okay. If I want to find a good constant. Then what I did is was just that uh, I had to take the good potential function and uh, and work with that, and so it's ugly in computations. But if you just want to have a NH plus a, a big O of N, then you do have some natural proofs which are much more enlightening, I would say. So let's do it. Okay. So now I have discussed a bit team sort, and I will continue to do it, but uh, looking more precisely at adaptive shiver sort. Okay. And uh, what I will do is to describe uh, from uh, uh, high, let's say, uh, the run merge policy, how it works. Okay. So here, actually, the run merge policy, it uh, requires you to maintain some stack of runs. So we will see some example of how this works. Okay. So originally, my stack is empty, and then uh, I will put runs in it, and then I will work with them. And then, until the array is sorted, I will be able to do three kinds of things. Okay, so it's either uh, I start looking at uh, entries of my array, and uh, so I see some uh, non-decreasing run until I see some entries that decreases. So, for instance, if I'm going from zero, I go to four, and then I see the zero, and so I will see that my run ends at four, and I have discovered a new run. Okay, and in that case, when I have discovered a new run, I put it on the stack. So it means that uh, basically I can uh, maintain pointers to the first and last elements of the run and uh, put them uh, put a pair 
with these two pointers in the stack. Okay. Uh, but uh, as I said, later we will just focus on uh, on the length of the run. But basically, whenever I will write some length, you can imagine that I also do have pointers to the first and last element of the corresponding run. Okay. So this is the first action I can do. And then the second action I can do is uh, I will take some runs uh, at the top of the stack. So let's say the first and second run. And so they will correspond to ages and runs in the array. And then I will merge them. Or I can uh, take the top second and third runs in the stack that will also correspond to adjacent runs in the array, and I will merge them. And so here, what's important, since I maintain a stack, is that uh, I want only to manipulate runs that are at the top of the stack. Okay. And basically, whenever some runs will be adjacent in the stack, then they will be adjacent in the array as well. Okay. And finally, something that is important and that I will repeat in the example I ran just afterwards, is that, OK, first, I should not manipulate runs that are deep in the stack. But also, those decisions I make for choosing whether I will do one, two, or three, they should be based only on the runs that are at the top of the stack and not deep. Okay. So, I mean, let's see what it can give. Okay. So, imagine I want to start my algorithm. And so far, I have discovered no run yet. Okay. And so, it's just on the left part, I have put my entire array with its data. And then on the right part here, I have just stored the, the, the length of the runs because I said it's only relevant information. So uh, here, OK, I mean, basically, I had just so between 1, 2, and 3, but there are no runs to merge. So I did 1. I discovered some run and pushed it on the stack. So here, I mean, I, I put in red the run I've just been dealing with. OK. And so I have discovered the run that would span from 0 to 4 here. Its length is 4. And so I put that run in the stack. Uh, and then I continue. So uh, there are still no runs too much. So it turns out that uh, the rules of adaptive shiver so tell me, oh, you should do one again. So discover a new run and put it on the stack. Okay. And so that's what I do. Uh, and now, I mean, like it's not obvious whether I will do one or two because either I could discover a third run of length one, or I could decide to merge the runs, uh, the first and second runs in my stack. Okay. And so in practice. For reasons I, I will make clear later, but not yet, the algorithm tells me, ah, oh, you should discover an additional run. Okay. So for now it's black magic, and later it will become white magic. Okay. And then, uh, so we continue. The algorithm still tells me that I should discover a new run. And so now, in particular, I mean, I have written here like, on the right that uh, then my decisions in the algorithm, they can depend only on uh, the three first runs but not on the fourth one. So I can manipulate only the top runs in the stack. And my decisions, they can depend only on the top runs in the stack and not what's be beneath. Okay. So in particular, now for taking decisions, I cannot remember that uh, my stack is of height 4 or that it does contain some run of length 4 uh, I mean, uh, behind. Okay. And then my algorithm here. OK, it turns that out that it tells me that I should merge the second and the third runs. So I'm about to merge the runs of uh, length uh, 3 and 1 here. OK. And then it gives me some new run of length 4. OK. Uh, and so now I'm in my stack. Before, it did contain four elements. OK. And now I have merged two of these elements into one. Yes, so Michel is en train d'écrire. Ah, no. Maybe I continue this example. Uh, and then, so uh, the algorithm still tells me that, OK, now I should run, uh, merge the runs uh, 2 and 3 again. OK, so I merge them. And then the algorithm tells me, OK, so now you should discover a new run. So I put it again. OK, so now I have come to the end of my array. And then the algorithm tells me, OK, I mean, uh, just uh, merge the top runs. OK. And in the end, when I have uh, finished uh, so merging all my runs and I just have one remaining run uh, on my stack, then it means that uh, my array is sorted. Okay. So that's how, in principle, both adaptive shiver sort and team sort do work. And uh, yep. yeah, yeah, sure. If you do have questions, please ask. Okay. Uh, uh, and so, I mean, well, the difference is that they do not have exactly the same uh, rules for saying whether you should do one, two, or three. Okay. 
but otherwise they are the same. So now, I mean, uh, before actually saying when we do one, two, or three, which I will do in the end, but which is not the most important, I mean, I will say um, which was the ideas that led to these rules saying that you should do one, do or two, or three. Okay, because it's what's important is uh, how you can come up with uh, uh, which choices you should do so that you will have a low complexity in terms of merge cost. Okay. And so here, uh, the idea is that, uh, so each run, so I mean, in this slide and the next slide, I will always identify a run with uh, its length. So here are, it's both a run of length R and uh, the length R itself. Okay. So each run should pay its share of the total merge cost. And then when you sum all the shares of the runs, it sums up to the n plus nh part. Okay. So we will see that more clearly uh, at the end of the slide. So in particular, I mean, something that you can first do is that each run will pay a big O of R to enter the stack. So what I call run entry phase. So in particular, if you do this for every run, then the total uh, uh, price that you have paid uh, for those run entry phases, it would be just a big O of N. And so uh, this uh, can enter our error term, okay? Because I said I would just have a uh, proof with some error term that is linear in N, okay? If I want to have the constant, then I have to be careful, but here I don't care. Okay. And so in practice, what will happen during that phase is that basically if I want to pay uh, for, for uh, uh, some linear uh, price in the length of my, of my run, okay? Uh, then certainly that price should not include merging the run R itself too many times, okay? Because otherwise it will be super linear in R, and that's not what I want. Okay. So instead, uh, that run entry phase it con just consists in uh, using the rule three, as written here, which is you merge the runs number two and number three uh, in the top positions of your stack. So the run number one, which is the run R that has just been pushed onto the stack, it's not yet merged but you will uh, merge the run uh, number two and number three, okay? Like, uh, I mean, these two runs, and then later you will, so now they will form some run, okay? And then later you will uh, merge the resulting run with some run that is below, etc. And so, uh, I mean, certainly, maybe zero time, but some amount of times you will just apply rule three, and at some point you will be done with uh, that rule three, okay? And so, uh, so basically, that's what you get. So you can have some, uh, some collapse of your stack. Okay, You do have some uh, runs that are merged together. Uh, and then, so what we should expect retrospectively from uh, that uh, run entry phase is that uh, R pays from, uh, for every merge. Okay, And then if you want uh, this uh, total cost of all those merges to be linear in R, well, a good way to do it is that uh, your uh, stack of runs, if you consider just the length of those runs, uh, they form uh, some uh, sequence that does have exponential decay. And then this uh, run entry collapse here concerns only those runs uh, whose lengths are shorter than R, because then if you look at uh, those prices that you have paid for merging all of them, it's basically RK plus RK minus 1, and then plus RK plus RK minus 1 plus RK minus 2, etc., until you arrive to RK plus RK minus 1, etc., plus uh, rh minus one. And if you do the sum, here you will find that you have some kind of uh, geometric uh, series or convergence series when you divide it by r, okay? And so in total, the total price of uh, those merges, it would be linear in r, and so that's, uh, that's fine for our purposes. Okay. So here what's, what's important is that you don't pay too much, and at the same time, uh, the cost allocation you do uh, should remain simple so that you can, uh, so that some normal human being can analyze your algorithm. Okay. And then, uh, in the second phase, at some point, you will need to, to merge the run R itself. Okay. And then you should do it when you double uh, the size of R. Okay. Because it's basically uh, when you take two runs of the same size and then you double them, you merge them together. It's basically where you have, I mean, uh, lost uh, the least amount of merge cost. Okay. For instance, if I want to merge uh, one large run and uh, one small run, uh, it's a bit of overkill because uh, I have paid lots and lots just to incorporate a few elements from the small run into the large one. But now, if I uh, merge uh, two runs with uh, approximately the same size, 
then okay, I mean, this merge is more balanced and therefore it should or it could uh, be uh, more efficient. Okay. And so this notion of more efficient is basically you want to merge R when it doubles its size. Okay. But in practice, it's nothing that you can ensure because uh, double exactly the size of your runs, it should mean that you have merged it with a run, another run of size exactly R itself. Okay. Because here, if I do have R and here, if I do have R prime, okay. And I want both runs R and R prime to double their size, then it would mean that they are the same size and it's not something that you can ensure in practice. Okay. So instead of doubling the size of R, we will relax slightly this notion of doubling. Okay. And what we will do instead is to increase the bit length. So what it means is that if I do have some run of uh, length five, for instance, and then I merge it with some run of uh, length seven, okay. Then in the end, I will get something uh, so of uh, length uh, 12, okay? And so now, if I write uh, 5 in base uh, 2, it has a 3 bits. If I write 7 in base 2, it has 3 bits. And if I write uh, 12 in base 2, it has 4 bits. So you have uh, one more bit to write the length of uh, the resulting run from, uh, from the merge. And so that is approximately 5 and 7. When you multiply them by 2, it's approximately 12. It's fine, okay? So this is the criterion that we have for saying that we have a double R. It's just we have uh, increased the bit length you need to write uh, the integer n in base 2. Okay. And then, so before I had said that in the run entry phase, you should just merge runs that are smaller than R. And in practice, okay, uh, since this notion of uh, bit length uh, seems to be nice, we want to adopt it here too. So it's just that you will merge runs whose uh, bit length is smaller than the bit length of R itself. Okay. And then in particular, having exponential decay here, it's also easy to express in terms of bit length because you can just say that whenever you go up in the stack, the bit length, so the number of bits you need to write uh, the length Ri decreases. And so uh, in practice, uh, so you would have some entry phase and then some stabilization phase uh, in which you will merge some uh, adjacent runs if and only if uh, their bit lengths are equal to each other. Because in particular, I mean, like, if uh, Ri and uh, Ri plus 1, they both need uh, L bits to be written, these integers, then uh, the resulting run from the merge, it would, uh, its length would be Ri plus Ri plus 1. And if you write it in uh, base 2, it would have uh, L plus 1 bits instead of just L bits. And so both the lengths of Ri and Ri plus 1, uh, I mean, they have one more bit now. And so here, you see that we have a criterion that uh, is much more uh, relaxed than uh, the one we would have before. Okay. And so in practice, if we do this, uh, then every run, it would pay uh, some cost that is linear in its length when it enters uh, the stack. And then, well, it can increase the number of bits it has, uh, only uh, a logarithmic number in terms of uh, the fraction uh, n over r. Okay. And uh, whenever it does that, well, it will pay for its own merge, so it will pay R, okay? But now if you do the sum of uh, all uh, this uh, big O of R plus uh, this uh, R times uh, log, okay, for all runs, actually this exactly gives you the upper bound of NH plus a big O of N, okay? Yes, so Christophe, you have a question? I, I prefer to stop now because like I do have this uh, slide and then I will change the slide. So if it's too late, then it's bad. Ah. Ah. Vincent, we do alternate between the phases, right? For instance, uh, yeah. I mean, like, basically, when I put some run, then it starts with uh, the entry phase, which may be empty, OK? And then uh, we have the stabilization phase, which may be empty either, OK? And then I push another run, and so I start a, a new run phase that corresponds to the new run, and then I start a new stabilization phase, etc. Okay, that's fine. Okay, okay. So uh, now, actually, I okay, I sort of cheated because I said that we should ensure that we will run uh, merge the runs Ri and Ri plus one if their bit lengths are equal, and that also we should ensure that we have some exponential decay here. Okay. And so that's what we need to do next. But uh, otherwise, uh, provided that we can achieve these two points, okay, 
I mean, given the cost allocation that we have chosen, then uh, our upper bound on the emerge cost of uh, adaptive fever sort should be correct. Okay. So that's what we will look at in the next slide. Okay. And here, so now I give you the details of adaptive fever sort and uh, uh, the algorithm for choosing whether to apply one, two, or three. Okay. So here I have just written li uh, the bit length of the integer ri. Okay. And so the algorithm is as follows. So if the run uh, in so the third run of the stack uh, is smaller uh, in terms of bit length than either the top or the second top run in the stack, then I merge it with the second run in the stack. And otherwise, if uh, still uh, my top run is larger or equal than to the second run in terms of bit length, then I merge them together. And otherwise, I don't merge. Okay. And then if I don't merge, I will discover and push some new lengths on the stack. And finally, obviously, if I don't have anything less uh, to, to discover, then I will just keep uh, merging the top two runs in my stack because I need to complete uh, the algorithm. Okay. And so in particular here, I mean, basically, you see that we would like, I mean, the sequence uh, L1, L2, L3, etc., until LH to be uh, strictly decreasing. Okay. And so we have performed. Uh, because then it would ensure that we have some exponential decay. And here we decided that we would perform some merges uh, when the sequence is not decreasing. Okay. Like, uh, I mean, if LH is at least LH minus 2, certainly the sequence is not decreasing. And otherwise, if it's decreasing, then it's fine. And we only look at the possible counterexample to the fact that it would be decreasing in the top of the stack because it will be sufficient in practice. Okay. So here, what happens is also that, I mean, uh, I said that this algorithm is called adaptive shiver sort, okay? And there is some shiver sort from which it was adapted from. And it's just that it did not contain the rule three, okay? But it already contains the rules uh, two and one. And then the same uh, proof as before could be applied to have just an upper bound in uh, n log n, but sharp, okay, in terms of merge cost, like with no multiplicative constants. And so now, I mean, the, the proof for those, uh, I mean, loops I had put before, okay? So like here, I mean, uh, for the fact that my sequence Li should be decreasing, okay? And that I should uh, merge only runs with the same bit length during stabilization. Well, what you do is just you, you perform some inductions. So you do have some invariants, which are listed here, and then you perform your induction. And so, uh, okay, you can check that uh, the induction works and that the invariants are really invariants. Uh, and that's uh, that's it. So here, I mean, it's not a big deal. It's technically not challenging. Uh, I don't want to spend more time on that, but it's just you have the invariants, you check them. They are very simple. It's all always like uh, 10 lines proof for each invariant, and that's it. And in particular, so the first invariant, it already tells you that you do have some kind of exponential decay, okay? In particular, on run push. Okay? And then uh, the last invariant, uh, the fact that uh, during the stabilization, uh, LH would be at most LH minus 1 and strictly smaller than LH minus 2, plus the above uh, invariant already. This gives you the fact that uh, when you merge some runs during the stabilization, it's because they do have the same bit length. Okay. So it's just, I mean, you have your invariants, and they are quickly adapted to exactly what you wanted to have. Okay. So that's uh, the end of the proof. So in practice, obviously, if you want to have details, I mean, it's better to look at the paper. But really, the ideas are there. Okay. Uh, and so just uh, uh, as a bonus, it turns out uh, that uh, the, the second rule, which I have written in gray here, is actually not needed for the algorithm to work, meaning that if you omit this rule, okay, maybe it will just you will just perform some uh, run pushes, so discovering a run and pushing it onto the stack. I mean, not in the same order as you would do before, but otherwise you will perform exactly the same merges as if you did have uh, that additional rule. Okay, so just if you want to have the most simple uh, possible uh, version of the algorithm, then uh, that rule is not needed. But at the same time, it's much easier to to prove the invariance if you do have that rule. So that's why uh, I kept it. Okay. And so, in conclusion, I mean, uh, well, what you should take away from that talk is that uh, the algorithm team sort is good in practice and in theory. So in practice, well, it's obvious because if it were bad in practice, it would not have been implemented and kept for 15 or 20 years. Okay, 
and it's good in theory because of uh, this kind of uh, upper bound uh, evaluations, for instance, plus other reasons that I did not mention today. And then there is some other algorithm that performs even better because here the constant that you have is not three halves, but it's one in the worst case. Okay. And at the same time, you do have adaptive fever sort that is both better than team sort because of that uh, uh, constant here, but is as simple. And so it's really the same uh, dynamics. It's just you tweak a little bit the rules, but otherwise it's the same structure. Okay. And, and then, so here I wanted to give you uh, some references. So as you see, the first two references are quite old, okay? And it's because uh, when you want to find the optimal uh, merging strategies for our runs, actually, it amounts to finding some, uh, I mean, some kind of Huffman tree, okay? So the cost of your favorite binary prefix encoding, but in which uh, you could uh, make two nodes sidings if and only if they were, uh, I mean, next to each other uh, in your original array, okay? And so this is a variant of a uh, Huffman problem for, for coding, okay? And in practice, this problem had been studied in, in the 70s. And uh, so who Tucker and then Garcia and Vax, they had uh, found uh, optimal strategies for finding the minimum cost trees, okay? Which is a minimum cost uh, strategies for merging. Uh, however, in our context, I mean, uh, although these would be the optimal strategies in terms of the merge cost, okay? They are not so good because if you look at uh, the architecture of the computers, I mean, something that I did not mention is that why TeamSort was very efficient is because of the cache structure, etc., that it uses. And so, I mean, using the stack and looking just at the top runs of the stack was really efficient if you take into account uh, cache issues. Okay. And if you want to use Hugh-Tucker on the Garcia-Vax uh, strategies, I mean, you will be very uh, cache inefficient. And so, uh, maybe you would have some optimal merge cost, but it would uh, damage uh, really badly your multiplicative constant, and so it's not worth it in practice. And then, I mean, later, I do just uh, mention uh, some papers about uh, team sort or, in general, adaptive sorting uh, with this kind of entropy with run lengths, and then uh, what uh, some colleagues and I did about like a team sort or adaptive silver sort itself. Okay. So, well, that's all. Thank you, and uh, please ask questions, but not too difficult, please. Okay, thanks. I'm uploading uh, myself. <laughs> okay, great. So if people have questions, maybe you can unmute yourself. It will be quicker. Yeah. So, so uh, well, I see the question is uh, in the chat, so from Laurent. Would an algorithm managing both increasing and decreasing runs would be interesting? Yes. So in practice, uh, team sort uh, or adaptive cyber sort, uh, they manage both. Okay. So that's what I said at the beginning. I said that, uh, ah, okay. So, I mean, like, uh, at the very beginning, I said that I just deal with non-decreasing runs. And in practice, if you also do have decreasing runs, then it's easy. I mean, you just uh, decide to, when you discover some decreasing run, you will have some uh, additional phase where you decide to invert it. And then now it's increasing. So, for instance, right. so sure, sure. I mean, uh, it would like. I mean, you don't want to say that uh, the totally unsorted uh, array is very bad. I mean, obviously, it's very good. So, okay. can I ask a question? It's Frédéric. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, Frédéric. Okay. And then I will look at those questions that are written. But uh, Frédéric, come. Yes, uh, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned some issue with the space on... Uh, ah, yes, yes, for, uh, for team sort implementation uh, is uh, Python. Yes, and I don't understand what they could be. Okay, so, uh, okay. So here, actually, uh, I will come back to, to that uh, picture. And uh, we need a stack, okay? And in practice, so here, I mean, like, if you admit the fact that uh, the sequence of allies is decreasing, then basically, if you start with some, uh, I mean, if you want to some uh, to sort some array of uh, length uh, two power n, I mean, uh, your stack it will have uh, at most uh, like uh, n plus three elements in it, okay, something like it. And so, in particular, if you know beforehand the length of your uh, of your array to sort, you may decide to implement your stack uh, on a fixed size array, okay. 
But then it turns out that, uh, so I mean, with similar arguments, you would have uh, upper bounds on the size of the stack that you need uh, to uh, run a team sort on, on some uh, array of uh, uh, length 2 power n, let's say. Okay. But uh, the upper bound was false. And so what happened is that uh, the array that was used to implement the stack, it was too small. And then you had the out of array, out of bound array exception like this. Is that clear? Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, I got it. But the yeah. stack could be just linear, in fact. Just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it's okay. just that uh, in practice they had uh, hard coded it, and then it was uh, too little, and then uh, you have your exception okay. and uh, it's done. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now I, I take the questions uh, in order in the chat. Okay. So uh, Michel, uh, can you sort a large file? Larger than the memory size and paging cost uh, become dominant. Yes. Okay. So here, actually, we just uh, so for instance in Java, it's just about uh, sorting uh, arrays of, of lengths uh, at most like uh, uh, one billion, something like this. Okay. Like it's a uh, max integer minus four. Okay. And uh, and so I mean basically, well, I mean if you want to sort larger and larger files that are not uh, that do not fit in the memory size. And uh, then uh, it's not sure that uh, team sort is the best algorithm. Or maybe, but certainly you need to find variants uh, to do stuff in parallel because you cannot have uh, everything in, in RAM. Okay. But it's not the purpose of uh, this algorithm. So you have uh, lots of other people who, who work on this kind of problem. And, uh, and then they do come up with different strategies, which depend on uh, which are your limits on uh, and which is uh, the cost coming from. Okay. But uh, I mean, it's not the purpose of team sort itself. So uh, basically, you you could, but uh, maybe it's not the best algorithm for that. If you do have paging cost or whatever, uh, then I, I'm not very familiar with uh, those algorithms, so I don't want to say anything wrong. But uh, it's not my it's not obvious that you should choose team sort uh, as it's coded now. Okay. So then. Uh, Alexandre, is there a, a reasonable theoretical model that captures the efficiency of cache access to compare all those algorithms with uh, respect to that? Uh, well, uh, basically, what you can do is uh, study the number of uh, of writes that you have to do, where uh, some data goes from uh, some level of cache to uh, another one. Okay. So, uh, I, in particular, I mean, I did not focus on, on that myself. So uh, I know a few things, but not too many, I would say. But uh, so some things that I have seen in a bunch of papers is that you would have several cache levels like L1, L2, L3. Uh, and then uh, when something has been in L1 for too long, certainly you will uh, relegate it to L2 and you have to rewrite it again. And then uh, certainly accessing to L2 is uh, more expensive, etc. Uh, and so there have been uh, models that uh, try to, I mean, capture Basically, if you have some idea of uh, how much it costs you to write in uh, whichever level of cache, uh, then to see whether, in practice, your algorithm would be cache adaptive. So meaning that even if you don't know the size of your cache, for instance, or how much it costs you to write in whichever level of cache, then uh, basically uh, your algorithm won't be too bad, regardless of which are the precise uh, constants that you do have on your computer. So for instance, a good algorithm, it would be uh, not too bad if you have a very small cache, but it would either not be too bad if you have a cache that is uh, 10, large, uh, 10 times larger. And uh, it's the same algorithm, and it doesn't need to know which is the quantity of uh, L1 cache that you have. Okay. So basically, this is, uh, this is something that uh, has been looked at uh, for in, in many papers. Okay. I don't know if this uh, answer is fine to you, but uh, it's one of the best I can give. And then, so there is Christoph, uh, partitioning in mixed, increasing, and decreasing runs seems not trivial, right? Uh, so what is done in, in team sort? Ah, okay, so I will uh, look at Simon's uh, question uh, next. Uh, so what is done? So uh, maybe I can um, come back to my first slide. Yeah, I, I, okay, I, I can select it. It's, uh, it's uh, more efficient. Okay. So here we had uh, this one, okay. And for instance, so I, I don't know if I will answer correctly uh, Christophe's uh, concern, but uh, here, for instance, we could have something like uh, uh, three, and then a two, and then a zero, okay. 
And basically, if you just uh, want to, uh, so imagine we do take into account, uh, I mean, uh, increasing and decreasing runs, okay? So here, I mean, a, a naive, uh, well, just a standard algorithm, you would start, so you see zero and then two. So now you see that you are looking at some non-decreasing run and you go to four and then, ah, you stop because after four, you have three, okay? Then, so you have three, you continue, you see the two, and then, okay, so now you are in some decreasing run, and then you continue, you see the zero, and then, oh, you see a four, so you stop, okay? And then you start again, you see a four, and then here you see a one, so you are in a decreasing run, and then, oh, you see a three, so you stop, and then again, you see a three, you see a two, so you are decreasing, and then you stop, and here you, you have your final, uh, you have your, your final run here, okay? So for instance, this is feasible, and I mean, this is really easy to chunk your date, your array, in terms of uh, such runs, okay? And, and then in practice, uh, what we would do, I mean, for instance, is just uh, if I see the 3 to 0, I mean, what I can do, so it's not exactly what is done, but uh, virtually it's the same thing, is that, uh, oh, I, I just swap the elements, and so I reverse the order, so it gives me 0 to 3, and then it gives me uh, 1, 4, and then it gives me uh, 2, 3, and, and now, I mean, I do have uh, non-decreasing runs everywhere, okay? And so this is uh, virtually costless. So that's fine. So that's how it's done. Okay. So then, Simon, does adaptive shiver sort stand for cache adaptive? Uh, no. It means uh, adaptive, uh, adapted to the repartition of the data into runs of different lengths. Okay. So in general, I mean, the notion of adaptive is used just because you have a, a some measure of complexity and you don't know it. But nevertheless, your algorithm, it will be good with regard to that measure of complexity, regardless of uh, that value, okay? And so that's what is used here, okay? So that's why we, I decided to call Shiver sort uh, adaptive. Okay, so are there any other questions? All right, maybe. One more. What if we are not interested in preserving the relative order of identical elements? Well, then it comes for free. I mean, it's just that uh, if I want to use a merge uh, sort algorithm on an array, as I mentioned uh, a bit later. Ah, uh, could you? Ah, okay, yes. So, yeah. Okay, I understand here. Uh, so, yes, in practice, uh, what is done in, in team sort in real life, okay? So, here I slightly lied to you, but not too much, is that doing this for very small runs. Uh, is useless, okay? And, and so what is done is that uh, um, for runs of uh, length, let's say, uh, less than 16, I mean, uh, they are just uh, merged uh, with some uh, ad hoc uh, algorithm, uh, ad hoc subroutine, and it, which is uh, faster than, uh, than this policy in practice, okay? So exactly as you say. So uh, actually, you, you can merge them by preserving the relative order of the identical elements for small runs, or uh, or not. Actually, you can. Uh, I mean, if you are not interested in preserving the order, that's why as, that's uh, good as well. Okay. And, and so, in practice, what is done in uh, in team sort is that uh, uh, the threshold that uh, will uh, distinguish between small and large runs is uh, basically uh, so all runs be, uh, that are with at most uh, sixteen elements are small. Okay. All runs that are with uh, at least 32 elements, they are large. And then in between the threshold is just you take uh, the power of two, so you divide the uh, n by two until you fall between uh, 16 and 32, and this is your threshold. So below the threshold, you will just use your uh, ad hoc uh, subroutine to uh, merge your runs or sort them or whatever, okay? And uh, if you are not interested in preserving the relative order, then you can use your favorite ray, which may be uh, faster, okay? And then for large runs, since you need to merge uh, adjacent runs for the reasons I had mentioned uh, earlier in my talk, then, uh, I mean, in practice, it's uh, just a bonus that you will preserve the relative order. 